Welcome back to the A+. My name is Nahum, and tonight we're examining the recent reports from the Auditor General and the Ethics Commissioner that has sent shockwave through the Canadian clean technology sector. Let's take a closer look at the timeline of events that led to this investigation and its significant findings. Ms. Vershuren, I, I have a problem with the discrepancies between the questions that I asked you and the answers you gave Mr. Cooper. I asked you if in your official capacity you acted in a way that would have furthered the interests of your organization. You said that that happened 18 months prior, and yet the conversation around the COVID funding uh, happened in 2020 and 2021. Uh, under your own board governance, definitions of a conflict of interest. It arises when a person exercises an official power, duty, or function that provides an opportunity to further their own private interests. Would you not agree that over $200,000 of COVID funding furthers your own private interest? The board considered the, the, the... I asked you a very direct question. I need a very direct answer. For you, do you not consider that by moving a motion to provide $200,000 worth of funding an organization that you were the CEO of does not constitute, at the very least, a perceived conflict of interest, if not a very real one. I the 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 COVID payments were were made uh, as a portfolio of companies. They were made. Uh, uh, all the conflicts were, were assumed previously declared. Uh, did you did you receive an ethics commissioner uh, approval for this? You did it in, in, when you came to the board. Yes. But I didn't hear you say that you did that on this particular vote. Why not? Again, we 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 took the position that uh, these COVID payments were broad. It was an operational issue. The lawyer, who is also a member of your council, took that position. Could you not appreciate why? that the perception to the public, the taxpayers who are watching this, hearing the discrepancies in that line of reasoning, would see that as a problem? You know, the, the minutes of March 20th board meeting demonstrated and showed this. And did you recuse uh, it, yourself from that vote on the COVID funding, or did you move the motion? The, I, I believe I moved the motion. You didn't recuse yourself? The, the, uh, the, 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 it wasn't Do you regret the way. decision not to recuse yourself from that decision? I took the advice of my lawyer. The lawyer who's a member of the council of the organization that you belong to? I took the, the, the advice from Osler. Why no, why no ethics commissioner? That would have cleared you right here today. But right now, i got to tell you, somebody came into this fairly objective. This raises more questions than it does answer. I put very specific questions to you. You made it appear as though you did not act in the interest of your organization after you joined the board. That we now know to not be true. The SCTC board, executives, and senior management must be held accountable for their gross mismanagement of taxpayer money and the gross misconduct that's been perpetrated by the toxic senior management team that has victimized countless employees. And the federal government must also be held accountable for its embarrassing lack of oversight that's allowed these problems to persist and its egregious cover-up of the truth that occurred this fall. At the beginning of this year, a comprehensive 345-page presentation was created and submitted to the Privy Council office at the request of the Office of the Auditor General of Canada, who we originally went to. This package contained documents that outline gross mismanagement across every aspect of SDTC's operations and governance. It highlighted non-compliance with the SDTC Act and contribution agreement across all of the organization's funding streams and serious breaches of the conflict of interest policies by the executives and board. The package also included evidence of the toxic workplace culture that was created by CEO Leah Lawrence and her friend and still current VP Zoe Kolbuck, who've been allowed to continue abusing and harassing employees by a passive senior management team and board that protects and hides the abuse. All of this information underwent review by PCO and was then forwarded to ISED, 
who subsequently engaged RCGT to conduct an independent fact-finding exercise to validate this information. Here are the findings for everyone. The Seed Fund, Ecosystem Fund, and Scale Up Fund were all found to be ineligible due to multiple violations of the contribution agreement, significant deviations from the due diligence process, and conflict of interest breaches by board members and executives. This finding encompasses nearly 200 companies that all received over $80 million, all of which was improperly funded using taxpayer money. The two COVID payments in 2020 and 2021 were also given to the full portfolio of companies and totaled almost 40 million and were also deemed to be ineligible as the use of these funds was not effectively tracked. And several board members in that instance also violated conflict of interest by approving almost $4 million to themselves to over a dozen companies where they all hold significant ownership or executive positions. The report also revealed that SDTC lacked HR processes or policies and issues were never even reported to the board. And conveniently, the RCGT investigators couldn't even find a single record of any complaint ever being made in the history of the organization. This is a staggering level of incompetence, willful ignorance, and corruption that has resulted in SDTC improperly distributing almost $150 million in taxpayer dollars just in the past few years and abusing dozens of people that have only tried to talk about the truth. The organization deserved to be suspended. The organization also deserved a new board executive and senior management team, but that never happened. Not a single one of the individuals responsible for these issues has faced a single consequence. No executive or board member was terminated or even given the slightest handcuffs. And every single person that was directly implicated even had their names redacted and protected by ISAD in the RCGT report. Even more shocking is the fact that despite these findings, ISAD continues to allow these individuals to manage taxpayer dollars and allows them to per continue perpetuating the abuse against employees who've been desperately seeking protection from their own government for over a year. That cannot stand. SDTC's board and executive continues to insist that the issues are just minor inconsistencies, while I said in the minister continue to claim that no findings warrant serious action. These are false narratives and I'm here to provide documented proof of all of the lies that continue to be perpetuated by both SDTC and ISAID. I believe that my testimony can provide an in-depth overview of the key issues at SDTC because I worked on the financial due diligence and compliance of projects at SDTC for the key two-year period that coincides with the most serious findings in the RCG2 report. I am also intimately aware of exactly how I said understood the issues and the clear direction that the total bureaucracy had laid out. The minister and PCO have been aware of this file for more than they are telling to the public and there are even documented evidence that they even engaged with everyone at ISED to make sure there were edits to the briefings before they were officially sent to them. All of this is backed up by documents, transcripts, and recordings, some of which we've already submitted to this committee. Thank you, and I welcome all your questions. Look, I, I, uh, I understand business. I've been on boards for uh, almost 30 years. Um, I uh, take responsibility and governance very seriously. Um, I am uh, chair of a governance committee of a major company in Canada. I, I understand. Okay. Um. It appears that uh, we have uh, lost a witness. We'll try to figure out the reason, uh, and uh, I will then suspend the meeting until we uh, until we get a hold of uh, Madame Verschoen.
Report on Sustainable Development Technology Canada. I want to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. This audit examined whether the Foundation Sustainable Development Technology Canada managed public funds in accordance with the terms and conditions of contribution agreements and its legislative mandate. It also examined Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada's oversight and administration of public funds. Between March 2017 and December 2023, the Foundation approved $856 million of funding to 420 projects. We found that there were significant lapses in Sustainable Development Technology Canada's governance and stewardship of public funds. Specifically, the Foundation awarded $59 million to 10 projects that did not meet key requirements set out in the contribution agreements between the government and the Foundation. I am also very concerned by breakdowns in the Foundation's governance. The Foundation was not always following its conflict of interest policies and it failed to comply with the Canada Foundation for Sustainable Development Technology Act. The Act requires the Foundation to have a group of 15 members, separate from its Board of Directors, to represent Canadians and appoint most of the Foundation's Board. We found that the Foundation did not comply with the legislation because it had only two such members instead of the required 15. En ce qui concerne les conflits with respect to conflicts of interest, the Foundation did not have an effective system to maintain its conflict of interest disclosures and related actions. Although we found 96 cases where directors had followed the conflict of interest policy by declaring their conflicts and appropriately recusing themselves during voting, there were 90 cases where the Foundation's records show that conflict of interest policies were not followed. These 90 cases were connected to approval decisions that awarded projects nearly $76 million in funding. We also found that Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada did not sufficiently assess whether the Foundation complied with contribution agreements. Through its limited monitoring activities, the Department could not ensure the funds were spent according to requirements in contribution agreements. In addition, the Department did not carry out compliance audits of the Foundation and it did not monitor conflicts of interest. Like all organizations funded by Canadian taxpayers, Sustainable Development Technology Canada has a responsibility to conduct its business in a manner that is transparent, accountable and compliant with legislation. Our findings show that when this doesn't happen, it's not always clear that funding decisions made on behalf of Canadian taxpayers were appropriate and justified. Colleagues, I am now ready to rule on the question of privilege raised on September 16, 2024 by the House Leader of the Official Opposition concerning the alleged failure to produce documents pertaining to Sustainable Development Technology Canada. In his intervention, the Opposition House Leader argued that several government departments and agencies failed to adhere to a House order for the production of documents related to Sustainable Development Technology Canada 
which was adopted on June 10, 2024. His assertions were based on a series of letters provided by the speaker, to the Speaker rather, by the Law Clerk and Parliamentary Council and tabled in this House pursuant to that order. The Law Clerk had been directed to report to the Speaker on whether the respondents had in fact complied in full with the House order by the stipulated deadline of 30 days following the adoption of the order. The letters were tabled on July 17, August 21, and September 16, 2024. In some instances, only partial disclosures were made, either owing to redactions or because documents were withheld. In other instances, the House order was met with a complete refusal. Le leader parlementaire de l'opposition a... The Opposition House Leader argued that the House's powers to order the production of documents are absolute and, as a result, the government was in contempt of the House for its disregard of a binding House order. He therefore asked the Chair to find a prima facie question of privilege, enabling the House to consider a motion to reiterate the order with a new deadline and urging the Prime Minister to make it clear to departments that the House order ought to be complied with. The Leader of the Government in the House expressed concerns that the House order may trespass on certain Charter rights, in particular relating to police investigations and privacy. She also argued that it was procedurally inadmissible on the grounds that the, order, the, that the order exceeded the authority of the House by attempting to secure documents for the exclusive use of a third party, namely the RCMP, rather than for its own use. La leader a ajouté qu'avec cet ordre, la she further suggested that the order constituted an attempt by the House to appropriate the role of another branch of Canada's system of government, namely the judiciary, by authorizing the RCMP to obtain information outside the established and judicially based law enforcement processes. Indeed, she noted that the RCMP itself had raised concerns about accepting the documents, as it feared doing so may circumvent normal investigative processes and charter protections. The Government House Leader also indicated that the order was silent on whether the documents requested should be redacted. She suggested that, absent any other indication from the House, the Government should follow its statutory responsibilities by redacting documents to protect sensitive information. While the government House Leader argued that the House may have exceeded its authority in adopting the order, if the Chair determines that the matter is a prima facie order of, of privilege, she contended that the appropriate course of action would be for the House to refer the matter to the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs to shed light on the contentious points. The House Leader of the Official Opposition returned a second time to rebut arguments advanced by the government House Leader namely those on the admiss admissibility of the motion, the nature of the motion, and the scope of the House's power to order the production of documents. Le député de Windsor. The member for Windsor West intervened to argue that the order for the production of documents should be respected. He added that it is up to the House to decide whether it is satisfied by the nature of the response. The member of La Prairie contended that the government may well have had reasons to not meet its obligations, but that the privileges of the House are well established and the order was clear. He endorsed a prima facie finding. While both members noted the order was unusual, both maintained this fact does not excuse non-compliance. The House has been seized before with questions of privilege regarding orders for the product production of government. Neither the standing orders nor any statute delimits Parliament's authority to order the production of papers and records that it may need to carry out its duties. House of Commons Procedure and Practice 3rd Edition confirms this procedural and constitutional understanding, stating at page 895, and I quote, no statute 
or practice diminishes the fullness of that power rooted in House privileges unless there is an explicit legal provision to that effect or unless the House adopts a specific resolution limiting its power, sorry, limiting the power. The House has never set a limit on its power to order the production of papers, unquote. The House leader of the official opposition pointed to the partial production of documents provided to the law clerk. As we have been informed, there were many redactions and omissions which were made by the various departments and agencies that produced the documents. The House order indeed did not explicitly require that the documents be provided in unredacted form, nor did it make provision for departments and agencies to preemptively omit or redact portions of documents or documents in their entirety. On this matter, only the House can judge if it is satisfied with the production of documents that it has received. Le concept selon le... More generally, the understanding that it is for the House to determine how to exercise its power to order the production of documents is also set out in Joseph Mangot's Parliamentary Privilege in Canada, second edition at page 190, where the author states... Quote, the only limitations which could only be self-imposed would be that any inquiry should relate to a subject within the legislative competence of Parliament, particularly where witnesses and documents are required and the penal jurisdiction of Parliament is contemplated. Unquote. The procedural precedents and authorities are abundantly clear. The House has the undoubted right to order the production of any and all documents from any entity or individual that it deems necessary to carry out its duties. Moreover, these powers are a settled matter, at least as far as the House is concerned. They have been confirmed and reconfirmed by my immediate predecessors, as well as those more distantly removed. To lend support to the absolute nature of the, of the power to order the production of documents, the House Leader of the Official Opposition relied on the ruling on a question of privilege of April 27, 2010, from Speaker Milliken, centering on the, on the House's right to order documents. He stated in the debates at page 2043 the following, and I quote, Procedural authorities are categorical in repeatedly asserting the powers of the House in ordering the production of documents. No exceptions are made for any category of government documents, unquote. La leader du gouvernement à la Chambre a tenté... The government house leader attempted to argue that this particular order for documents was different, insofar as the documents were not to assist members in carrying out their duties, but instead to be transmitted to a third party. For this reason, she claimed that the order was beyond the authority of the house. The chair would suggest, respectfully, that these concerns ought to have been raised prior to the motion's adoption. Je rappelle... I would remind members that if there are concerns about the procedural admissibility of any motion, they should be raised with the chair before the motion is debated or, at the latest, before the House is called upon to vote on the matter. It would be difficult, perhaps even inappropriate, now for the chair to retroactively comment on its admissibility.
in his landmark ruling on documents relating to Afghan detainees on April 27th, 2010. Speaker Milliken spoke eloquently of the need for reflection, collaboration, and even accommodation in such matters. While asserting unequivocally that the House had the right to order the production of papers, he also recognised that the House generally understands that the government has responsibilities to protect certain information. In that case, it was a matter of balancing national security concerns with the duty of elected representatives to hold the government accountable for its decisions. In the case before us, the government and the RCMP, and even the Auditor General, an officer of Parliament, have expressed concerns about providing the documents in question to the RCMP. While it is ultimately for the House to decide how it wishes to proceed in the face of such, in the face of such objections, the Chair is of the view that it would be valuable to afford an opportunity for the concerns expressed by the RCMP, as well as by the Auditor General, to be addressed fully, and I would hope for a mutually satisfactory solution to be arrived at. I believe the best way for this to be achieved would be to follow the usual course for a prima facie case of question of privilege, that is, a referral to the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs. Such a referral would allow for a more detailed consideration of what documents remain to be submitted, what has been withheld and why, uh, what has been withheld and why, and, most importantly, how the House can ensure the intended recipient, the RCMP, is in a position to act as the House would wish it to act. La Président. The Chair acknowledges that, in recent years, other privilege motions have been brought forward rather than the usual referral to, referral to a committee, although previous speakers have, on occasion, insisted on a particular course of action. My predecessor's ruling of June 16, 2021, found at page 8,550 of the debates, stated, and I quote, a review of the rare exceptions shows that there was a certain consensus on the procedure to follow and, thus, on the wording of the motion. As Speaker Milliken confirmed in a ruling on March 9th, 2011, at page 8,842, the Chair is of course aware of exceptions to this practice. But in most, if not all, of these cases, Circumstances were such that a deviation from the normal practice was deemed acceptable or there was a unanimous desire on the part of the House to proceed in this fashion. There are also precedents that support censure. In short, given that the parameters for such motions are clear and that the practice is well established, the proposed motion should be a motion of censure or to refer the matter to the appropriate committee for study." Unquote. I would also refer the House to the same ruling made by Speaker Milliken on March 9, 2011, in which he found that the proper course of action in those circumstances was to refer the matter to committee. At page 8,842 of, of the debate, he stated, and I quote, I hasten to add that the powers of the Speaker in these matters are robust and well known. In 1966, Mr. Speaker Lemoher, having come to a finding of prima facie privilege on a matter, ruled a number of motions out of order. As House of Commons Procedure and Practice, second edition, tells us at page 147, footnote 371, in, in doing so, Mr. Speaker Lemoher more than once pointed out that it was Canadian practice to refer such matters to committee for study as suggested that this should be the avenue pursued." Unquote. The table officers and I are available to help the House Leader of the Official Opposition craft an acceptable motion. The House will consider the matter as soon as the member is ready to move his motion in the appropriate form. Conservatives would have liked to be working today to counter the doubling of housing costs this Prime Minister has caused, or the record food price inflation, which has been 36 percent higher in Canada 
than in the U.S., but unfortunately the Prime Minister has paralyzed Parliament by refusing your ruling directing his government to turn over evidence in the $400 million green slush fund scandal that the, Ver the Auditor General says involves 186 conflicts of interest, wow. with the chair of the fund found guilty. What has he got to hide? The Honourable Leader of the, of the Government in the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is not being truthful with Canadians. It is the RCMP Commissioner himself who said the RCMP's ability to receive and use information obtained through this production order and under the compulsory powers afforded by the Auditor General Act in the course of a criminal investigation could give rise to concerns under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It is therefore highly unlikely that any information obtained by the RCMP under the motion where privacy interests exist could be used to support a criminal prosecution or further a criminal investigation. Mr. Speaker, let's get this. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This is a $400 million scandal involving Liberal appointees giving millions of dollars to their own companies, and the minister's story is now changing. Yep. Last week, she claimed that the government had given documents to the RCMP. This week, they claim that if they gave documents to the RCMP, it would cause the Charter of Rights to come crashing down. <laughs> it sounds like there's a new story every week to justify paralyzing Parliament to cover up the truth. What is in these documents about this $400 million scandal that the Prime Minister is so afraid of? The Honourable Leader of the, of the Government in the House of Commons. This is a typical witch hunt from the Leader of the Opposition to go after people who have nothing to do with this. These are files such as personnel files that contain private information of individuals who have nothing to do with what is going on. Mr. Speaker, it is the RCMP and the Auditor General themselves who raise concerns with this motion, and it is the government's view that we should send this to committee so that we can get on with the important work of this House and protect the rights of Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. A witch hunt. The Ethics Commissioner, appointed by this government, has found the chair of the fund in violation of the law. The Auditor General, also appointed by this government, says there were 186 conflicts of interest involving Liberal appointees giving millions of dollars to their own companies. $400 million. Potential criminality, according to the main whistleblower in the scandal. Any other employer would ter voluntarily turn over all the evidence to the police if it had been ripped off by its own staff. What is the Prime Minister hiding? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House of Commons. Mr. Speaker, if and when the police request that information, it will obviously be handed over because that is proper judicial process. But when it is Parliament that is doing it, this is where Canadians should be concerned, Mr. Speaker, because when he is going after the rights of other Canadians, it's only a matter of time before his political vendettas come after the rights of all Canadians.